Hello and welcome to episode 226 of the Juice Box Podcast. Today's episode is called The Perfect Bolus, and it is installment number nine of my Diabetes Pro Tip series with CDE Jennifer Smith. I'm going to make this episode ad-free, but I'll probably give them a mention here and there. You know, not a whole, like, big sell, but still, I really love the advertisers. Please remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box Podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise, and to always consult a physician before becoming bold with insulin or making any changes to your medical plan. If you find yourself loving Jenny as much as I do and you'd like to hire her personally, you can go to integrateddiabetes.com to find out more. There's also a link to Jenny's email address right in the show notes of your podcast player and at juiceboxpodcast.com. Hey everyone, Jennifer's back and we're here today to talk about the perfect bolus. So (laughs) that already sounds like a a topic that everyone's going to get upset about when they hear, but I think, (laughs) but there's a lot of different ideas here. So Jennifer, what I was thinking was boluses differ depending on situation, right? You might have a high blood sugar, a low, you might be falling, you might be rising, you might have a new site. There's you a might lot have just of exercised. You might, yeah. Keep going, right? You may have just exercised. Yeah. You might have your. You might be ill. You might have your period. You may be coming into having your period. You, you know, your dog might have eaten the other dog next door and like you're dealing, right? With a little bit of anxiety going. And there's right? different things. Your dog may have eaten your next door neighbor's dog. Jennifer, has that ever happened in your life? No, thankfully. Really? They, they, uh, psychologists say that if you make up something like that, it comes from something. I don't believe that because my hu- <laughs> my humor is so bizarre that I look back sometimes and I think, but that was something really strange I just said. Does that have any real connection to my thoughts? And I've really looked closely because I've been worried in the past, but I don't think that's true no, for everybody. No, I've got a chocolate lab and I don't think that that's even in there. Totally not in their nature. So anyway, <laughs> no, it's never happened, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> so you people have already learned that chocolate labs are not carnivorous, um, <laughs> at least oh. towards other dogs. Other dogs, no. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Oh, yeah. So anyway, so I want to start with, I mean, we're just going to pick one, right? Let's say your blood sugar is where you mean for it to be. Your basils are in check. They work well. You haven't eaten in a while. It's the perfect scenario, the one that they described you in the doctor's office the first time you're diagnosed, right? Right. Your blood sugar is 95 and you're hungry and you're thinking, what am I going to do? So ideally, we know at this point now from listening to the episodes, we, we, we have to figure out what our length of time for our pre-bolus is. Right. But how do we know how much to pre-bolus? And I I think the answer always has to be, I can't tell you. Jennifer can't tell you. It's situational, but that you'll learn through trial and error. So, but let's make this one general, right? It's a it's a nice balanced meal. You've got some vegetables, some carbs. There's protein. It looks like it looks like a plate from a, a Super Friends episode that the government told you how to eat in the seventies. Right? <laughs> it's the food triangle. Let's call it the food triangle. So so. If you're a nice steady blood sugar, if if my daughter was at 95 and I thought this was a pretty, you know, average meal as far as what I expect mm-hmm. as far as impact back from it, I might put in all of the insulin, mm-hmm. you know, at, at in the beginning. But I also might right. look and say, hey, there's bread in there, a potato. That might stretch out the action of, of you know, the impact of the carbs over more time. So maybe I'll put in. I don't know, 50% or 60% and then stretch it out over a half hour, an hour, just to create, like we've talked about in the past, that kind of blanket of insulin to cover the the entire right. impact timeline of the carbs. I think that the thing to remember is, is that there can't be really a set idea for what that means. Like maybe you'll figure out a meal eventually and say it's 70% and 30% over an hour. And you might get to that point at some point. And many people do. Mm-hmm. Many people who have pretty consistent intake um, or like the same things over and over. Um, but the variables that could be around that will sometimes change even your more standard figured out meal. Yeah. And and, and so I think, so my first, my first step, I'm telling you, 
any good bolus, the one that has any chance of working, I think is a nice simple way of saying it, has to have a pre bolus. Like you have to start yeah. you have to start getting the momentum of your blood sugar moving down so that when the carbs start acting they move up. So so that's the to me that's step one. Now mm-hmm. do you talk about or do you in your own life use combination of bolus and basil in situations like this? Uh, in some situations like this, perhaps more often, uh, more often what I do and more often what I teach is pre bolus based on some of the meal content, because some of that does, it does work together. Things like glycemic index. Um, and also as you brought in to begin with the, where the blood sugar is starting, Mm -hmm. Is it coming in standard at your target? Are you coming in, but it's already dipping down? Are you coming in in target, but it's already drifting high? All of that is where you can also look at bolus timing Mm -hmm. and how much pre-bolus you may need. So, you know, coming in at a blood sugar of 95 with a straight horizontal line the past hour, awesome, that looks great. But the minute you put food in, that that blood sugar line is going to start to change pretty quick after that. If there's not time for that insulin to tug first to begin work. Right. Yep. I hear what you're saying too, about like understanding the glycemic load of different like foods. If you have something like, you know, using Chinese food, such a great example because it normally incorporates rice, which stays for a long time and hits you hard and usually some sugar that'll hit you fast. So if there's something sugary in there, you may need, a, a real you know push of insulin in the beginning to combat that initial rise, but yep. that initial rise could get beat up by that insulin very quickly, and now what's left over is the you know the rice that the lingering to effect, work. right? And yeah, so absolutely. And, go ahead. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just going to follow with yes, you could in that instance then have the potential for needing both bolus and a basal potential change, right. and that's also where we talk about basal. Um, most doctors are like, well, basil shouldn't ever be used for food or covering anything. Well, we've learned very differently, especially with fat. Mm-hmm. Fat requires a huge amount of of basil change in the aftermath of eating your typical pizza or, you know, burger and french fries or mac and cheese that's homemade or whatever it might be. Oftentimes you need 40, 50, 60 percent of an increase in basil for many hours after that meal or you're going to stay stuck high. Right. Or you could end up hitting it with so much insulin up front that you think you've avoided that. And then three or four hours later, you start rising and you think it's for no reason. Right. And it's still that fat is. It's still the fat. Yep. So I like a, in what I call carby situations, I, um, which is not a word, uh, but, yeah. but in, in higher carb. <laughs> oh, it is in our world. <laughs> in our world, carby is absolutely a word. Right. Right. So with carby <laughs> foods, there, there's a couple different ways I use a temp basil, and we talked about it before. But in this situation, if I thought a meal was 10 units for sure, but I wanted it to be spread out more, Arden's basil rate being 1.4, I might double Arden's basil for an hour mm-hmm. and a half and catch two and a quarter units that way, and then take some of that out of the of the, the bolus of the up bolus. front, right? Absolutely. Because okay. you get a lingering effect from the basil, and you get less up front, but you're still getting the whole bolus you determined you needed. Okay. Same meal, Jenny, rapid fire. Same meal, but I walk in the door from work, and my spouse says, dinner's ready, and it hits the table. I can't pre-bolus. I didn't know this was going to happen. Oh. What do you do? And that's where I, I'd like you to lay out the idea of overbolusing for people here. Yeah, and that's overbolusing essentially. That's a good super bolus, as you kind of we talked a little bit about before. Mm-hmm. That's a situation where a hundred percent, unless that meal is like a plate of broccoli, right? In which you would never need a super bolus <laughs> or a pre bolus, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or pre bolus, right? right. In your typical meal that we're saying we're having, 100% of super bolus would be beneficial, where you actually do take a load of insulin that would be your basal behind. You add it on to the suggested bolus for what you're going to eat, and then you may actually knock off the basal behind so you don't go low later, but you've gotten the load of insulin, the push up front. Right. The other option that many people do in that situation, too, is they take the bolus and they may actually turn their basal up 100% for an hour. Okay. To also try so to help with actually, that spike. 
Right, exactly. So that they're getting a bolus, they're maybe not quite sure if the food in the bolus, even though it's happening at the same time, is going to cause as much of a rise. Mm -hmm. But they're definitely saying, I know I need a lot more because I wasn't able to give that 20, 30 minutes before this. Yeah. And and I think of overbolusing in two situations. So the one, I don't have time to pre-bolus. So in my mind, the way it strikes me is I now need the insulin for the food for the high number I know is going to come because I didn't pre-bolus and some to stop the momentum or stop the arrow, right? And so if I thought the meal was definitely six units, but I thought, wow, there's no way this doesn't go to 250, I bolus the six units and I bolus like I'm trying to bring down a 250 250. at the same time, right? That's like, again, listen, we're calling these, you know, we're calling these this series diabetes pro tip. So this is like ninja level stuff. Like you don't, don't try this on day one, but at some <laughs> point, right on day one, don't go, I didn't pre bowl so I'm going to double my bowl. Please. Right. I, you know, right. Yeah, please don't. <laughs> but as you're figuring things out, that's a great place to do. As you've heard in past episodes, um, there's a very famous book called, is it pumping insulin? Uh, pumping insulin is John Walsh. And he's mm-hmm. the one who talks, talks about super bolus. Yep. Right. I and call then it, yeah. the other Go ahead. Oh, you go, you, I know you call it something else. Yeah, what right. do you call it? I call it overbolusing. But over-bolusing, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to say the other, you know, the other concept that kind of comes in here that you sort of just alluded to is where is the blood sugar going to likely be? And that trajectory, you know, right. assuming that, okay, I might be 95 right now, but if I haven't pre bolus I could easily be 250 in the next 30 to 60 minutes. Yep. Okay, you're taking that value it's looking at the trajectory of where it will probably be and using that glucose value to add on to the current bolus. Okay. So you're avoiding that really high blood sugar. And what I say on the podcast, which people might remember is I just say, you have to trust that what you know is going to happen is going to happen. Right. Yeah. Right. So you can't just pretend this will be the time this doesn't happen. You know, Oh, I'll get away with not pre bolusing today. There's that, that doesn't make any sense. It might happen yeah. once in a while. But that's some rando reason from something earlier. That's not, you right. know, that's not. That's the I ran 10 miles and don't usually ever do that. And, and now, ooh, that. look at that. My blood sugar doesn't spike. <laughs> so now another place to use an overbolus as a pre-bolus is a, is a place where this, the, the concept in my mind is the same. The situation's different. What if I've been fighting with my blood sugar all day? And I just can't get it down. It's 200, but I know I, I'm going to eat in an hour. Like it's dinner time in an hour. And I've been, you know, pushing and pushing little boluses, little basal rates, and I can't make this 200 move for whatever reason. Maybe it's a site not working well, whatever it is. In my mind, I bolus the meal, I bolus the number, I over bolus up front and create a fall that I then catch with the food. So I reverse. I re- we're going to talk about this in, in the next episode, but I reverse the way I think about it. I think most of the time we consider how does the food impact my blood sugar? How does the mm-hmm. insulin impact my blood sugar? We don't often enough think about how does the food impact the insulin, and, right? Right, and that's and we've talked we talked about that in an earlier episode too, where we put a little, I, you know, we put a little boy's blood sugar into a free fall and yep. caught it by eating at the right time. So all we're talking about any of these situations is timing, right? It's the right amount. Mm -hmm. It's the right amount of insulin at the right time. And if your blood sugar is 300 and you have to eat an hour from now, well, the right amount of insulin is now. And, you know, it's, it is now, and you can't, you can't just wait and do your 15 minute pre-bolus on the 300 blood sugar because you've lost already. Right. Right. And you know, some that, that kind of goes along too with the concept that catching catching the potential drop while also sort of avoiding or taking care of a higher blood sugar in pregnancy with the women that I work with. It's kind of similar. We actually, at some point get to um, bolusing. That's like a split, a split meal Mm -hmm. where you actually load the front of that meal time with the whole bolus, but you only actually eat about 70% of the food now and you catch the drop about an hour later with the rest of the meal. Interesting. So what you get is not a spike not going above those post meal ranges for p- pregnancy, but you also catch the drop on the back end and you never go low. Yeah. That's very similar to how I handle um, days like Christmas or Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. The idea that there's yep. always going to be eating. So I, yes. oh, I'm always pre-bolusing the next grazing opportunity, right? Like, Absolutely. Oh, boy, that's interesting. I- 
I do for holidays is I actually, knowing I'm coming into a grazing time period that's going to be a lot less than precise, Mm -hmm. a lot less, um, and a lot of little nibbles along the way behind any holiday where I know I'm going to be hours of nibbling and eating, 25% increase in basil. Right. And then again, I bolus along the way. And depending on where glucose is, I might nudge that along the way too. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So now... What happens if dinner is taking a little too long to make and my perfect 95 has turned into a 90 that turned into an 80 that turned into an 85 and now it's 75 and now, now someone's yelling, dinner's going to be ready in you know five minutes. I know that for most people that makes them feel like, well, I'm too low to pre-bolus, but no, you're not. And, and so you have to get some insulin moving and you'll learn how much you can do over time. But in the, in the interim, it's got to be some. Something, right. right? You're just, you're drifting low. I'm not even talking about for Dexcom users. I'm not even talking about a diagonal down. I'm just this, this blood sugar that just is kind of drifting down. Your pre bowl still takes as long as it takes to eat. Uh, to, to, excuse me, as long as it takes to work. So if you're 75 and drifting down, pre bolusing right now is not going to make you start crashing down. It, it, oh. And if that does happen, that was a coincidence. That's not you. Again, the insulin didn't just start magically working like that, right? Science, right. science didn't change. So you still need a pre bolus. Now I get if it's a it's a big meal and you're like, well, I can't put in eight units while I'm 75 diagonal down. You're right, you probably can't. But you could put in some. 20 yeah. 20% of it even. And we do this a lot while Arden's at school because we pre bolus 20 minutes ahead of Arden's meal at school while she's still in a class. Mm-hmm. And I'm still pre bolusing if she's 85. So if I give and Arden gets a big bolus at lunchtime while she's at school, much larger than most any other times in her life. 12, sometimes 13 units, right? For a 145 pound kid. And so I might do a 0% upfront and the balance over a half an hour. So it's all kind of getting squeezed in, but it's not all going to come online and be active right away. It might be 20% upfront, but you have to get some sort of that momentum happening again on the, on the action of your insulin, you need your insulin to be pulling down when the food goes in. Correct. Right. Okay. And that's important even for kids, I think, in what you're doing. That is important, especially for little kids where you're not quite sure. I know a lot of the people, I, parents I work with, but I don't know how much Billy's going to eat or Susie's a really slow eater or, you know, today she might love spaghetti and she'll love it for the next three days, but then she hates it and I prepared it and I bolused for it and now what's going to happen, mm-hmm. right? You. For the most part, kids and teens will always eat, as you said, a percent. Let's say that you always know they're going to eat 10 grams of something. Even if you have to change what it is, they're going to eat something for you. Yes. So if you can bolus for that little bit up front, it's giving insulin, again, more action before you put food in. And one of the many, many reasons that Jenny is on the show is because... If Jenny wasn't here, that would have been the next thing I would have said. It's a, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's perfect. You you parents of little kids, it's a perfect idea. Get something moving, even if it's a little bit. Just get something moving. Give yourself a fighting chance. And to Jenny's point, there's an amount of food. If you look back at your kids' meals, they always eat at least a little bit. And by the way, if they really flake out and don't, or if uh, as in the case of the interview I did yesterday with the mother who said she was so excited she put the insulin in. Uh, grabbed some like fast food and drove away and the kid fell asleep while they were driving away, right? (laughs) You know, okay, that might happen. It's happened to me, but still a little bit of juice, right? If you only put a little bit in, all you've done is pre-bolus a couple of sips of juice. You don't have to worry about the food. The point is, is that the pre-bolus is always important. It's, it's, listen, if you're crashing down as the food's hitting the table and you're literally 50 and your blood sugar's falling, okay, that's your pre bolus, right? <laughs> right. Okay. You're now pre because pre- there's because there's already insulin that's causing the crash. Yes. Something whether you meant for it or not, you have been pre bolus by something, yes, right? By something. So, so good. Mm-hmm. So see that. Put the food in, and as soon as that stops, right? As soon as that down arrow goes away, it is time to get your insulin in. Um, you you absolutely cannot then say, well, I don't know, I'm 60 and that seems dangerous. No, what's dangerous is, is that you've put all that food in your body and it's going to start hitting you the other direction. Happened to us last night and I had to bolus, I had to make a significant bolus 
at a 75 diagonal up blood sugar because I was like, well, this is, I know what's going to happen. Let me get, let me stay ahead of it. Right. And the hard thing about using CGMs now, as wonderful, a hundred percent as they are, the hard thing is that CGMs do lag in times of quick change. Right. Right. And so if you have been diagonaling down, you're waiting for, you know, you want a pre-bolus, but you're not quite sure. Sure. Go ahead and eat as, but as soon as you see that horizontal or a bit of a trend up, I guarantee your finger stick is higher right. than the than the CGM is showing you. You're already at a deficit of insulin. Yes, yes, the deficit's an important way to think of it, and you and this is again something you'll learn over time. Like, yeah, this isn't like the first month of <laughs> again, not on your first day, right? You right. listen to all the episodes of the podcast, really absorb everything, go through the pro tip stuff, and then say to yourself, I and then you have to see it, right? You have to recognize yeah. it. There's a way for CGM users, you have to be able to look, there's like a bend in the line. It's hard to put into words, right? But on the three hour graph on the Dexcom, the last three dots on the right side tell a story about what's happening. And you will get to be able to glance at that at some point and say, oh, this is heading down, this is heading up, I can tell, I know. And so it's not day one, and it might not be the first month. But if what most of you report back in your emails is, anywhere close to true for most, somewhere in the three to six month range, this all just starts making sense in a way you you couldn't imagine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Early on in the podcast, I used to talk about it like uh, in the matrix when Neo stopped the bullets, but that has become such an old reference at this point. I'm afraid right now there's like a 19 year old going, the what, what are we talking about now? (laughs) I'm old enough. I totally know. At some point, at some point, diabetes makes so much sense to you. The bullets aren't even moving. You can just walk in between them. And so (laughs) you get there at some point, right? Okay. Uh, so I'm low, I'm high, I'm falling. Like it, in the end, I think you're hearing it's all about the right amount of insulin at the right time. Just like we've been saying over and over again, a new site is a good example of, um, I'm, I'm going to put this in here, even though it doesn't sort of fit, but it does fit. And so if you put a new site on and you find that your sites don't work as well immediately once you put them on, or, you know, you just have a site that doesn't seem to be re- as reactive as you're accustomed to, you still have to do what you have to do. You might have to do it sooner. You might have to do it more aggressively. And I know you're going to say, but what happens when that site starts working suddenly? Well, then it does. But mm-hmm. you can't not be aggressive when something like that's going on because then you that's how you end up at 300 all day long, staring right. at it, wondering what to do next, right? Right, right. Okay. I think the biggest the biggest piece of that pre-bolus message is unfortunately relearning. And it's a daily relearn mm-hmm. in the beginning of starting to pre-bolus. Rapid insulin is not rapid. Rapid is a bad word for it. It's a better word than our regular insulin used to be, which they called short acting. And I'd actually call that longer than short acting, <laughs> I guess. But uh, I mean, rapid is not instantaneous rapid, as they tell you it is. Right. It takes a minimum of 15 to 20 minutes to really get moving. Yes. If you don't leave this episode and in general this series believing that understanding how insulin works in your body is the core of this entire thing, you were not paying attention. Uh, so go back and start again. So you get a slap on the hand. Well, no, I'm kidding. I, yeah, I, I, I didn't go to Catholic school, but I mean, if you. <laughs> I did. Yeah. 12 years. See, see, Jenny's like, I know what happens when I don't listen. Someone hits me with a ruler. <laughs> So now I guess the last piece of this, right, about this perfect bolus thing, right, is in my heart, it's about remaining fluid. Now, you know, a lot of people are going to tell you you really have to count your carbs correctly, right, which is true. You can't use the wrong amount of insulin. Like, you know, you can't have a 50-carb meal in front of you and only put in 30 carbs and then act like, oh, I don't know why this didn't work. But you know from listening for me and for a lot of people who have been around type 1 for a while, like you just I, – I don't think about it as much as carbs. I think about it as units. I look at a plate and I think that looks like eight units to me. But if I'm wrong, and I am frequently, for reasons that I don't care why, right? Like maybe it's a bad sight. Maybe I missed on my pre Maybe Arden's sick. I don't care why, but I miss. Then I readdress immediately. Right. Based on my historical knowledge of how Arden acts, I know – That if I see a double arrow up after a a meal bolus, I screwed something up pretty big. 
and I go more insulin. That's where, and you mm-hmm. guys are starting to hear this. I'm starting to see you on online, like talking to other people that people are just going more insulin. I'm like, yes, I know that's from the podcast. <laughs> um, and so, but is she diagonal up? Well, then maybe I missed by a lot less. So a little more insulin, or right. I'll try to bump it back down again, or try to just try to stop the arrow. But staying fluid is the rest of it. Mm-hmm. 100% staying fluid is the rest of it. And I know that I heard someone say this the other day, and I like the way they put it, that the idea of stacking insulin in a glucose monitor world is not quite accurate anymore. Like you, like this person kind of went a little farther and said, you can't, you can't really stack insulin when you have a glucose monitor on because you're seeing that you need more insulin. Right. And I thought, boy, that's a big idea. I, I agree with it in, in totally in, in theory. Um, but most of you are going to be taught when you're diagnosed, don't stack insulin. And what they mean when they say that is don't put insulin in at one o'clock and then put more in it, you know, one thirty because you're going to get low eventually. And if you're not using a glucose monitor, that very well may be true. But Could be, right. right. If you can't follow it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if you can see your blood sugar, the direction and the speed it's moving in, you'd have to be incredibly insane to stack to the point where you'd cause some sort of a low that would make you right. incapable of responding to right. it. Right. And that's where even, you know, in the CGM um, one that we talked about, I had mentioned using those event markers. And the event markers can be hugely beneficial now that they also show up right on your screen. So you can actually see, where did I put the insulin in? You don't even have to go back to your pump to look at that or remember when you took your injection. Mm-hmm. If you just mark it, you will know when those injections went in. You can follow the trend line and you see, okay, do I need more? I don't need very much more. I need a little bit more, or a right. lot more, right? Yep. I've been, this is, is going to get away from this and we'll stop in a second, go to the next idea. But I've been talking to a college student a lot through Instagram messaging. And if you just heard that and think, oh my God, that's me, you're adorable. It could be any number of you. But, <laughs> but, um, but, but, but this one person just had a, a long, protracted high blood sugar that wasn't coming down. So finally, I just said, look, you you have to, like, crush this number and crank up your basal. Like, do a temp basal rate for hours, like six hours. Let's do 30% more and put in however much insulin you think is going to bring this down. And it took most of the afternoon, but they got there. And mm-hmm. then just with that idea of, oh, my gosh, I don't have enough basal insulin, the next day, here comes the 24-hour graph, 130 blood sugar. Because they're trying to live with not enough basal. Right. So as much as, as much as we're talking about the perfect bolus here, remember, you can't make the perfect bolus if your basal insulin is wrong. Correct. Right? You'll never be able to. Because Correct. you'll always be replacing basal that doesn't exist. Or if your basal's too high, you'll be causing lows and thinking, oh, this is the bolus, when actually... Right. It might not. And be. or if you are trying to really be aggressive with your bolusing, then you're bolusing and bolusing and then finally bolusing too much. And that actually brings you back down, in which case then you might be eating, you're sending yourself back up. And the basil isn't enough in the background. So it becomes a roller coaster. Mm-hmm. As so. infuriating as this is going to be, and then we'll, we'll, we'll end up this episode, but if your basil's right and you haven't had insulin or food for a few hours, your blood sugar is like 80. It's sitting right there. That's how you know you have your basil right. And so it should be stable. If, right, stable. And so mm-hmm. and so if you have stability at 140, a little more might have stability at 120, a little more you that's how you can learn to play with it. But I'm just telling you that if it's if it was, you know, as intended you know, by the heavens, then your blood sugar right. would be around 85 without food or insulin. It's not always going to be like that. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying if you're that far away from that number, you've got work to do on your basal rates. Right. Okay. So we are going to wrap this one up and then record the next one right away. Hold on yeah. a second. Thank you, Jenny, for taking the time to be here on the podcast. Don't forget, you can hire Jenny at integrateddiabetes.com. Her email address is in the show notes of your podcast player and at juiceboxpodcast.com. As always, I appreciate the support of the sponsors, Dexcom, Omnipod, Dancing for Diabetes, and Real Good Foods. You can save 20% on your entire order at realgoodfoods.com by using the offer code JUICEBOX. This was the ninth installment of my Diabetes Pro Tip series with Jenny Smith. There are more coming. In the beginning, I called it like a 10-part series. It might go longer. What do you think of that? 
If you're enjoying the podcast, please go to iTunes and leave a rating and review. The five-star kind are the best where you say nice stuff. The better the podcast is reviewed on iTunes, the more searchable it is for new people looking for type 1 diabetes support. Thank you very much to those of you who share on Instagram, Facebook, and privately. I love that you guys are telling your endos and your friends and anyone who will listen about the Juicebox podcast. It's helping us grow. I appreciate it immensely.